Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so delighted that you are joining in with us this first day of July to study the Word of the Lord and to have our time of fellowship with God in His Word. I'm, I'm proud that you're with us, and I hope that you're having a great week so far. I pray that God has just blessed you and supplied everything that you need and has been the comfort to your heart and your soul in these days, it seems to be so perilous. Glad that you're with us for this Wednesday night Bible study. And I just pray that it's going to bless you and encourage you and be food to your soul. I ask God to make this a blessing to you just a little while ago as I, I prayed. I said, God, just, just let this be food and encouragement to your people. So good to have you with us this Wednesday afternoon. And if you have your Bibles, if you will go with me to the second chapter of the book of Hebrews and go uh, uh, get your device turned on, get your Bible flipped open and get into this wonderful chapter with us tonight as we study the Word of the Lord. This book, again, let me just refresh your mind uh, well, let me pray first. Let's, let's do that before we get too uh, deep into it. Father, thank you again for the day that you've given to us. Thank you for your mercies and for your grace. Thank you for the people that are, though we may be still limiting our time together as far as uh, coming together as a corporate body, Lord, they are still are gathering around the computer, around the telephone, God, even some around the television. To, to watch this, to hear this, and to be helped by this. And Father, I just pray that in these days, Lord, that we understand the great importance of the Word of God. This, If there's ever been a time when we need to be people of the Scriptures, it is today. It's in this moment, in this hour, Lord Jesus, where the world is shifting and changing and the rapid pace of, of the end times is unfolding in front of us. And I just pray, God, now that this be life and light to your people, and that, God, we would be encouraged by what you say to us. Father, bless our time together now and strengthen us as we study the good word of God that helps us and keeps us. Bless us, I pray, and I ask, God, that Christ be honored and glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Last week, we opened up this great book of Hebrews, and we... Uh, had to understand the background. The purpose of the writing is always important. You, you cannot just jump into it and, and start reading it without understanding what, what it means. Why is it being written? That's how a lot of false doctrine and a lot of confusion will arise is because you don't understand the context of what is being said. You don't understand the environment uh, that has produced this letter. And so, so last week we found out that the, this is written to the Hebrews, Jewish believers, those that's converted over to Christianity, those that's been born again, and those that are following the Lord Jesus that are being pulled back to Judaism and to the Levitical system that God had liberated them from. And so the writer, by the inspiration of the Spirit, felt it so necessary to remind them of the superior uh, body that they are a part of, the superior uh, family that they are a part of. We are now, we have a superior high priest, we have a superior covenant, we have superior promises. And so this is why it was being written. They were under a heavy strain. They were going back. They were backsliding is what they were doing. They had not matured. They had not grown in their experience with the Lord as they should have. And because of that, this letter had to be written. And so in the previous chapter, in chapter 1, it started out so wondrous and gloriously. God, who in sundry times and divers manners spake unto the prophets, uh, in times past unto the prophets, uh, uh, now in these last days, has spoken unto us by his Son. He spoke to us by the prophets, to the fathers by the prophets. But in these days, he speaks to us by his Son. So we already see that there's a better speaker that's given to us, and there's no greater speaker than never man spake like this man than Jesus. And so uh, we, we saw how that the writer began to dissect the idea and to rip apart the idea 
that Christ would be inferior. Matter of fact, he showed that Christ was superior to angels and superior to even the Old Testament prophets. And so we ran that course and we saw the sonship of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, the, the position of Jesus being greater than all others in that first chapter. Well, we come to chapter 2, and really probably the four, first four verses ought to be in chapter 1. And with that being said, we'll get into to chapter 2. But it is the first four verses are really a continuation of what we picked up on in the first chapter. Last week, we left off dealing with angels. He never told an angel to sit at his right hand in verse 13 of chapter 1. He never, uh, he never exalted an angel. Uh, but he clarified to us that angels are ministering spirits that are sent forth uh, to minister to the heirs of salvation for us. And so with all of that being said, we come to verse number one of chapter two and we hear this word, therefore. And you've heard me teach and you, you know what I'm fixing to say here. What's that therefore, therefore? Why is this word used, therefore? The word therefore ties us to the previous statements. The word therefore lets us know that we are still dealing with what's just been said, therefore. There is a tie, there is a, the word therefore is because of. We understand that, that we're drawing back, pulling back from what's just been said and moving with it into the future. And so he writes and puts this word there, therefore, because Jesus is God's voice, Jesus is the one speaking, because Jesus is the message, Therefore, because Jesus is superior to all others and even to angels. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Listen to the warning of the writer. He says, I've just explained to you Jesus and his deity. I've just told you of his lordship and his greatness and his superiority over everything. Therefore, because I've just shared this with you, you've just heard this. He says, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. What is he saying? We ought to give the more earnest heed. The word ought there means it is binding. It is necessary. It is necessary that we pay close attention to the things that we have heard. The writer is warning them, don't forget what you've heard, but pay attention to what you have heard. What you've been taught, what's been preached to you, pay attention to those things. You must, it is necessary to pay attention to those things. The writer understood that if you don't pay attention to what you have been taught from the Word of God, what you've been taught about the Lord Jesus, that you, the, the doctrine, the settled and right doctrine of Scripture, if you do not pay attention to it, you are in danger lest at any time we should let them slip. And the word slip there gives the imagery of a boat that misses its harbor, it, it, that, that the current carries it away. He says, if you're not careful, if you don't give that more earnest, he pay close attention to what you have heard and what you have been taught. Remember, he's talking to second generation Christians here. He's talking to people, now some time has passed since the upper room. We're now getting into the second generation of the church and he's writing to them, don't let it slip past you. Don't let it flow away from you, the truth that's been taught to you. Now I find that powerful because it being the second generation church that's being warned, don't lose what you've been taught. Don't fail to pay attention to the things that I just told you in chapter one, which is basic the basic lordship of Christ. That's where we start. We, if, if we don't start with his lordship, then we miss the whole thing. He said it's basic. If you lose the simplicity of this, it, it will slip by you. You will go into a place of losing what you have, have received. And that's the problem with the modern church. We are so far removed that, there, that not only have we let things slip past us and we lose those blessed truths, is 
now that, that since the truth has slipped past us, whatever comes down the devil's river, we pick up on. They're all, I was praying uh, this week and the thought come to me in prayer that, they, that Jesus warned us whenever you hear someone say that Christ is over here or Christ is over there. He says, don't go after them. Because there's going to be many false Christs that will arise in the last days. Well, I used to think that that was people like David Koresh and those kind of nut jobs that would come up and say, I'm the Lamb of God and I'm the, I'm the one that you're supposed to follow. I don't necessarily believe it's just a person. I believe it's an idea, a false Christ, a, 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 a false Christ that's being preached, a, a Christ that's been changed to fit the culture. Uh, a Christ that, that is accommodating to the movements of the world. There are many false Christs. And the reason that the modern churches will jump at anything is because we did not hold on to the original. We let the truth of God's word slip away from us. And when we let that slip away from us, anything that does make it into our harbor, we will hold to it. And so here the writer starts off and warns him, pay attention to the things that you have heard lest at any time, at any time, I don't want to miss those words, in any season of life. Now I'm going to say something here. You know when you're young in the Lord and you're passionate you want to go after God there's a danger that comes with you, uh, comes in uh, if, you, if you walk with the Lord long enough that you will get to a season in life where you kind of go lack. How many Old Testament kings Asa comes to my mind that started out so well, started out so good, and, and, and did so wonderfully serving the Lord as king, but in his old age became lax. Even Hezekiah was a, a great man, a great king. And at 38 years of age, I believe it was, that he was diagnosed with death. And God told him to get his house in order, but he turns his face to the wall and pleads with God to have mercy on him and let him live. And God gives him 15 years. But what does Hezekiah do not long after this? Toward the, toward the end days of his life, he, he tours, gives a tour of, of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. And God gives him a warning. Hey, they're going to come back and get everything that they've seen here. He's, in, in other words, you see, there's a season in life that if we're not careful, you and I can get very relax and we can we can say well I know the Bible says this but the culture is this going this direction doesn't matter what direction that the culture goes we have a word forever settled that we must attach ourselves to and so the writer is warning them at any season in any time in any place of trouble in any place of persecution or any place of comfort he says do not let the truth slip past you drift past you and you lose out on it why Verse number two gives us the reason for verse number one. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. I take verse number three with it, Connor. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Listen to this. This is a warning to us. And I've counted, I think the word we is used about five times in three verses and the word us is brought in at the end so six times you and I we us are addressed in this and warned in this look again at verse 2 he says if the word the word if is not a, a conditional thing the word if means it is a statement of fact the word spoken by angels that is the law of Moses is what he is referring to here if the word spoken by angels was steadfast that means firm, straight, firmly resolved, unmovable and unbreakable, was steadfast in every transgression. That means a stepping over the line and disobedience. That means a refusal to hear, received a just recompense of reward. Now listen to what he's setting. He's setting the stage up and he's talking about the law of Moses here because we understand it was given by dispensation of angels, by the hands of angels. Again, we mentioned that Deuteronomy 32, 33, I believe it was, when Moses 
Moses rehearsed this and talked about the involvement of holy angels that were involved in the giving of the law. And so here we see that the writer says here that that word was steadfast. It was firm. It was, it was established. It was a word that was is unbreakable. It's a straight word. And he says because of that, every transgression, not one was overlooked. Every transgression, that's a stepping over the line. That's going where you don't need to go. And disobedience, again, that means you just refuse to listen, receive a just recompense of reward. In other words, because what the angel said was straight and you violated the law of Moses, the law of God, every transgression and disobedience had to be dealt with. It was to be dealt with because it had to receive the just reward, its punishment. So we're dealing with Old Testament concepts here. In, the, in, in verse number two, the law was given and the, it meted out punishment for every person that did not live according to it. God judged them because they would not keep that law. Even in the Old Testament uh, time period of the law, if adultery was committed, that the, the punishment for that was to be stoned to death. We see on and on where God in the law had provisions for punishment when the law was broken. But then we come to verse Verse number three, and he deals with us New Testament believers. He set the Old Testament up as an example, but he's not telling us we're under that. We're not under the law. We're not accountable for the law, but listen to what he does say we are accountable for. How shall we escape, we, you and I, the, those of us that's claiming to be born again, if we, this is not a verse of scripture written to the world, it's written to God's church. How can we, how shall we escape? How is it possible? If we can, for us to avoid wrath, if we neglect so great salvation. Remember who the audience is. We're dealing with people that are being pulled away from the salvation that's found in Christ. And he's telling them there is no escaping of divine wrath. If you neglect, if you, if you, uh, and that word neglects is a strong word. It means that you don't care for or you disregard. If you disregard this great salvation, salvation of the blood of Jesus, Calvary being the provision, the resurrection being the seal of this salvation. If you neglect it, disregard it, how will you escape this, this awful wrath of God? Again, ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking to the world here. He's talking to God's church. He's talking to people who's being pulled backward. He's talking to people whose, whose love for God has grown cold because of the environment where the they live has affected them. It is as Jesus said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Coming from a pastor's heart to your ears right here, I tell you, I've been grieved and I've been worried in these days of COVID-19. And I've watched as, as the churches try to deal with this. And one of the greatest concerns that I have for so many in these days is the adjustment to the new normal where the house of God is not important, where the word of God is not, and we'll take it when we need to and we'll leave it when we want to. We neglect so great a salvation. And again, this is a warning to God's church. It's not a warning to the pagan. It's a warning to God's people. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect, we neglect so great a salvation? And I want to say something here. It's a great salvation because it has a great savior. It's a great salvation because it paid a great price. I feel like running. It's a great salvation because it brings a great liberty. It's a great salvation because it's the salvation of the great God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a great salvation, a salvation that lacks nothing. There's nothing missing in this salvation. There's life and life abundant in this salvation. And he said, what are we gonna do if we neglect such a salvation as this? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. That's what we talked about in chapter one. In these latter days, in these last days, is spoken unto us by his son. Here he says at the first, the Lord preached this salvation. The Lord declared this 
salvation. He himself spoke of this salvation. And not only he, but we picked it up. The, the early church picked it up, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him talking about the apostles. He began to preach it and the, and the apostles began behind him to pick it up and to carry on. Uh, what was it in the book of Acts that when, when Luke was writing, he says, the former treatise I wrote to you of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. He began to do, Jesus began to teach it and to preach it and then the church was to come along and the apostles were to come along and to continue it. Well, that's what we are to continue to do in 2020, what Jesus began to do. He shows us here that Jesus began, this was, it began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed. Listen to that, that's a strong word. The word confirmed means to be guaranteed, attested, it means, it means to be verified. It is in something that we're just, just talking somebody else said to us. He said I, they were eyewitnesses unto us by them that heard him. That's what Peter talked about. He said we didn't declare unto you cunning device fables when we talked about and declared the coming of our Lord Jesus. He said but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were with him in the holy mount. We saw him transfigured. We're not telling you something somebody else told us. Here the word shows us that the word that Jesus began began to preach was confirmed, confirmed, guaranteed by the apostles. My God have mercy. I feel the Holy Ghost. I may preach this instead of teaching it. In other words, they said, yes, we saw him go to Calvary. Yes, we saw him hang there until he died. Yes, we saw them and we carried him to an empty tomb and put that, put that body in that tomb. We saw the Romans seal that thing shut and put a signet on there that no one greater than Caesar can open. No one but Caesar or greater can open this door. And we also saw the empty tomb. We saw the grave clothes folded up. But even greater than that, we saw him, thank God, when he walked into that room with us and said, peace be unto you. We saw him as, as this resurrected Lord, the ones on the road to Emmaus said, we saw him and heard him as he spake with us by the way. And oh, how our hearts burned within us. We saw him Peter could say, I saw him walking the sandy shores of the sea when he called out to us, children, do you have any bread? Do you have it? This is after his, after his crucifixion and resurrection and I'm backslid in heart, he would say. And I'm out there going back to my old, my old life, but we saw him, thank God, as he came and he called to me, do you have any bread? He, we said, no. He said, try the other side of that boat. We tried on the other side. That net popped and snapped because of the big catch of fish and John looked at me and said it's the Lord and over the side I went my goodness it was confirmed to us confirmed to us eyewitnesses 500 of them at one time those that saw him ascend into heaven and the word spoken by angels is steadfast this same Jesus you see go in like manner he will come again hallelujah to God ladies and gentlemen what the writers telling us is what we have is a sure word of prophecy and something that we can anchor and put our life upon and build our lives upon it. I don't mean to preach, but I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. How shall we escape if we neglect this salvation that was preached to us by the Lord and confirmed by them that heard those apostles that were eyewitnesses? And he goes on and he shows us the confirmation how that God helped to confirm it. He says, God also bearing them, the apostles witness, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Listen to these words. He didn't just say they came preaching something with no power. He said they came preaching with the, the evidence and the confirmation of signs and wonders. They came and they saw divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to God's own will. Listen to that. They came, they came, and, and when they preached, they preached with power. When they preached, they preached with anointing. And God worked signs among them. The dead lived, the deaf heard, the tongues of the dumb, dumb was loosed, and they began to sing. The eyes of the blind man were opened. God confirmed his word with signs and wonders and divers, different kind of all kind of miracles. But he didn't stop there, and he said, and the gifts of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. The workings and the gifts of the Spirit, the, the, the tongues and the interpretation, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, a prophecy, the gifts of healing, all of these different ones that were given. He says God worked with his eyewitnesses, the early believers in the gifts of the Holy Ghost, and he did it according to his will. Never did a miracle come at the will of man. Never does, never does the authentic working of the gifts of the Spirit come at the will of men. Amen. It all comes at the will of God. Now I want you to notice something that verse 4 ends with a question mark. This is a long question, so if I can run back real quick. He's asking us, how can we escape whenever all this has been done in front of us? How can we escape the wrath of God and a place called hell, if we, if we ignore, first of all, the voice that spoke first is Jesus, confirmed by those early church apostles, and with signs and wonders, God established that word. He said, how can we escape? In other words, the writer says, God has given us everything we need to believe his message. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, if we disregard such a great salvation, if we do not care for it. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there will be no escaping if we neglect this great salvation. With all that's been provided for us, there will be no escaping if we look at this salvation and say it's not sufficient. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? These four verses should probably be included in chapter one because it deals with that heart that wants to let things slip away from them. Oh, God, help me right here. I don't mean to preach, and I know I'm going to try to get the whole chapter in and all, but you listen to me, friend of mine. What have you let slip out of your life that you ought to have retained and held on to? You, the convictions you once had that you've let go, the conviction of the, the importance of the house of God and prayer and the word of God, that now you can, you can take it or leave it. Something's going to miss, and I'm telling you, you will not escape. You will not escape the wrath of God if you are a backslider in heart. Amen. Verse number five. Let me move on. I, 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 I thank you for letting me preach just a little while to you. Verse number five. He says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. And listen now. He's, he's getting back to the angels like he did in chapter one. And he goes back to the angels and he says, listen, the world to come and the ruling of the world to come, the kingdom of God and the world to come is not given to angels. They're not going to be the ones that rule. Matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that we'll be the ones that judge the angels. So I think it's 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, somewhere along in there, um, where you and I are going to judge, be, be judges. And so it, the writer here says it's not given to the world to come for angels to rule it. In verse number six, he says, but, in, but one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou vis visits him? Listen to this, this here. Now, this is, King, this is David that writes this in Psalms uh, chapter number eight. I believe it's David that writes in Psalms eight that he, he asks this question. And I love, again, the writer here is going to go back to, the, to, to Jewish uh, writers in the Old Testament and pull what they say and bring it and prove who Jesus is. Listen to the, the question. He says, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him. This is the, the question in Psalms, and he brings it into the New Testament. And he asks the question, talking to God, God, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is so important about man that, Lord, that you are mindful of him? What is man? In the grand scheme of everything, what is man that you would be mindful of him, that you would take thought for him, that you would care about him, that you would, you would make plans for his life? What is man? Or the son of man, that, that implies weaklings, people who are weak, those that are, are the product of man. What is, what is he that you would visit him? That means that you would look in on him. What is man? That's a good question. Let's think about it just real quickly. What is man? What is man that, that God Almighty would think of us and that God Almighty would visit us? Look at the world that we're in. What is man? Man's a brute. Man is, man is a rotter. Man is evil. Man is corrupt. Man is perverse. Man is cursed. Man is in trouble. 
But yet God in His goodness and His grace thinks on man. Thank God. He, he purposes for man. He ponders for man. He, he plans for man. He visits. My God, He visits man. He looks in on man. Oh, what do you think Christ did when He came to this earth? He came to man to check in old man and not just check in old man, but redeem man. He came and, 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 to, and to visit us. Verse number seven, he says, here, here, here's what he says, that man was in his creation, thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of, thine, of thy hands. Listen to this. In, in man's original creation, he was made just a little less, less, a little less in rank than the angels. That's what that means, a little lower, a little less in rank, but also it means for a little while to be less in rank. Huh. That's interesting. That means that God in his eternal purpose had a plan to promote man. And so here we see the, the, the original creation of man. God created man with glory and honor, crowned him with dignity. Man was created with dignity. And, and by the way, when we talk about man, we all come from one couple, Adam and Eve. So we're talking about all mankind was created to be something that is dignified with glory and honor crowned by God himself made just a smaller degree, lesser degree than holy angels and that even for a period of time, for a, a certain amount of time, for a lesser, uh, to be a lesser degree for a certain amount of time we were to be under the angels and God crowned man. God put on man dignity and he said he set him as a ruler over the works of his hands. See Adam? Adam named those animals that were in the garden. Adam was over the garden. Adam was the caretaker, the master over the garden. And, and, and this is how God created him. But look at our world. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let me get to the, to the next verse. Verse number eight, he says, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Huh. For in that he put all things in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. I want to stop right there. Listen to the original creation of man and what God intended for him. You put all, he put all things in subjection under man's feet. Man was to walk in dominion. Man was to walk in power. Man was to walk in authority over the things on this planet. He said, for, he, for in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing, left nothing that was not put under him. Left nothing. That man was to rule the beast. Man was to rule the, 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 the climate, if you would. Man was to rule every, even devils. Man was supposed to rule it. Everything, when it says he left nothing, he means nothing. That's the same as the word all, nothing. He, left, he put all things, that's all in that first line and nothing that's not put under him in that third line. He says to me, and then back up, he put all in subjection and the word all being used twice, nothing being used there. Here what we see that man has been given. He's given total dominion over this planet. We, we see how that God crowned him, God blessed him, God entrusted him with something. But then we come to this ugly little word in this sense. Sometimes it's a beautiful little word just depending on what side of the fence you're standing on. But we see in that last line, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Wait a minute. You just said that all, he was created to be a, a, a person and a, a creature of dominion. You just said all things were put under him. He is crowned with glory and honor. You just said it. But then you say, but not all things are under him. Well, what happened? Sin happened. The fall of man. Man allowed Satan to come in and usurp from him the dominion that God gave him. He allowed Satan to come in and to talk him out of the glorious position that he had been granted by an eternal and a holy, almighty God. 
And the enemy comes in all over a stinking tree of the knowledge of good and evil and appeal to the pride of life, the lust of the flesh and the lust of eyes of the eyes and appeal to that nature of man and cause the woman to be deceived and cause the man to walk behind her in disobedience. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. He th- my goodness, he throws the crown off of his head in disobedience to God's commandment. And therefore, there's a devil that comes in on the heels of it and says, what man forfeits, I will now take. And I'm gonna say something right here. What the church forfeits in these days, the devil will come in and take. That's why the culture's in such trouble. We forfeited it. We quit preaching truth in our pulpits and now a lie's paraded paraded around in the street as being true. I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the devil's a usurper and he will come in and take whatever you will forfeit over to him. Amen. Now you've heard me say this. I'm gonna say it again. Years ago, there was a song that was very popular. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. The reason he was able to steal it is you let him steal it. He can only take what you allow him to take. And man allowed him to have it all. God entrusted him with so much and and man says, I give it up. I give it up and give it over to the devil. And that's why the world is in the mess that it's in now. So here we've got a bleak picture. Man had so much. A disappointing picture. A sickening picture. Man had everything and he gave it away to a serpent. So what do we do now? Are we hopeless? No, I'm glad for verse 9. But we see Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man has dropped his candy, if I can use that expression. He is, he is messed up. He is now dropped to the level of a brute. He is now living by the passions, the unbridled passions of his flesh. He does the unspeakable things in the darkness and now we come to an hour where they do the unspeakable things in broad daylight. Man is corrupt. The, 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 the cancer of sin, the perversion of sin has, has just grown more and more. The cup of that iniquity has been, it's, it's getting fuller and fuller by the day. And, and we see that man is an awful creature but out of the dust heap of man's failure, the the Holy Ghost says, but we see Jesus. Look, there is a, the figure of a Savior. Hallelujah to God. There's a figure of an, of an answer to the mess and the dilemma of the world. But we see Jesus. Man dropped it. Man messed it up. Man failed. Man was an awful rotter. But we see Jesus. The contrast, ladies and gentlemen, to every lying politician, the, the contrast to every false way, the contrast to every criminal in the prison house, to every pervert that hides in the shadows. The answer to it all is, but we see Jesus, the bride and the morning star, the alpha and the omega. Oh, the one that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or imagine. But we see Jesus. We see Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the dominion that man lost. He's the one that's going to bring back what man gave away. Jesus, but we see Jesus who was, listen, was made a little lower than the angels uh, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Oh, what a verse of scripture we have in front of us. Uh, listen to the Listen to the phrasing. Listen to the way that he has described to you and I. He was made a little lower than the angels. Well, if I ain't mistaken in verse number seven, that was what I was made as, a little lower than the angels. What Adam was made as, a little lower than the angels. And he goes on and he said he was crowned. I'll go back to that line in just a second, but crowned with glory and honor. Wait a minute, I think that's what Adam was crowned with. So what you see here is Jesus comes in the form of of a baby, through the womb of a virgin girl and born into a manger, placed into a manger, comes into this world and he's made a little lower than the angels. And he is made for a purpose though. He's made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. I don't know that it's possible for angels to die. Apparently it's not 
because Jesus was made like that first Adam. He was made like, like that, that man that fell. He was made with that, that nature even of man. He came a little lower than the angels for the purpose of suffering death. He came to die in man's place to satisfy the wrath and the, the righteous judgment of God. He's crowned, now listen now, he's crowned with glory and honor. Look at this, there's a king that's gonna suffer death. There's a king that's gonna suffer death and by the grace of God, he's gonna taste death for every man. I list, list, looked at those words and thought of them strongly. He's crowned with glory and honor. He's come to suffer death and he's gonna suffer it by the grace of God. Listen, by the grace of God's gonna taste death for every man. Listen, there's two things I want you to think about in that phrasing there, by the grace of God, he's gonna, he's gonna taste death for every man. And let me first of all deal with it like this. God enabled his son through divine grace to do the unthinkable and the unspeakable and that is to taste death for every man and not just any death, the death of the cross, the most excruciating form of death. It was not even thought of to crucify a Roman citizen. Uh, it was you do not do that. that. That is a cursed thing. But Jesus here, he is, he is born uh, and, and to, to face such an excruciating death. They crucify him. He, he said God by his grace enables his son to endure the unspeakable. But secondly, I I want you to look at it in these terms. It is because of God's grace that Christ came to taste death for us. Because of God's goodness to us. Someone said the acronym of grace is simple. God's riches at Christ's expense. God allowing his son to come and taste death for you and for me is an act of divine grace by the grace of God. Because of the grace of God. It's God son tasted death for us. I look at that word tasted there and I wonder about it and I remember him talking about the cup, that bitter cup. He said, Lord, the Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He was about to have to taste that cup of, of suffering, that cup of death but I also look at it in, it in this context to taste something means he's about to devour something. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. He's about to devour something. Not only did he taste death and the suffering of death for every one of us, he devoured death for it. He devoured death for every one of us. Glory, 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 glory. That's why we can get into these next verses. He devours death for us. He, he tastes death for us, for every man. My God, preacher, does that mean that, that because I'm saved, I'm not going to die? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that you're not going to die in the physical sense, but it means that when you die, as a song that we used to sing, when my body slumbers in the cold, cold clay, I'll live on. Yes, I'll live on. There to sleep in Jesus till the judgment day, I'll live on. Ladies and gentlemen, he's going to take the sting and he's going to take the power of death away. He tastes death for every Every man, for every man, he will taste death for everybody that will put their trust in him. For in verse number 10, for it became him. It became him. It mean, that word became means it was fitting. It was right. It was right for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. And now that we're dealing with that from chapter one again, he, he, everything's made for him and everything's made by him. He's the owner, the ruler, the Lord of everything. But yet he suffered as Lord of everything in bringing, it, it, it was right for him in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Oh my Get a picture of this. The owner, the ruler of all things is going to bring many sons unto glory. You see, you don't get to glory without the captain of our salvation. You don't get to glory without the provisions of God's Son. You don't get to glory without Christ being your escort, your leader, bringing you there. Listen, it became him. It was right for him. 
to, to, in bringing many sons unto glory. It was right for him to make the captain. It was right, and talking about God the Father here, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. God put his son through the wine press of suffering. But he, he listened to how he describes him to us. He is the captain of our salvation. That word captain means the originator, the instigator, the, the champion, the author of our salvation. God made him, God made him suffer for us, made him perfect. That word perfect doesn't mean that he was lacking anything. It just simply means that he made him, it made him uh, to carry out the goal to completion the completion of God's plan of redemption for us. And he, the only way it could be completed was somebody had to suffer. Amen. You and I were the rightful ones that should have suffered. But oh, God said, I, I, the, judging them for their sins the right thing to do. But to show the goodness of my grace, I'm going to let the innocent stand in the place of the guilty. And I'm going to let him suffer on their behalf. God it saw it fitting and right to allow the captain of their salvation be made perfect through sufferings. Yes, he suffered even though he was Lord. Yet, yes, he suffered even though he was King. Yes, he suffered even though he is God. He suffered for us. Listen to me. I want to, I want to move on this. He's the captain of our salvation. A captain makes arrangements for his soldiers. He's the captain of our salvation. A captain gives commands to his soldiers. He's the captain of our salvation. A captain leads the way in the battlefield to, for his soldiers. And he's a captain of our salvation. He, a captain encourages his soldiers. And a captain, he's a captain of our salvation. A captain rewards his soldiers. Aren't you glad that he's your captain? Aren't you, the, aren't you glad that he's the one that's made the provisions for us to stand before a holy God right and righteous? In verse number 11, he says, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Well, let's look at verse number 11. Amen. Here, why did, why did he suffer? He suffered to sanctify. Amen. Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. I believe the writer of Hebrews will tell us later on in one of the chapters we, as we get there. To sanctify as he suffered. And here the word tells me, he that sanctifieth, he that makes us holy. And they who are sanctified, they who are made holy, are all of one. Who's the one? The Father. So he that sanctifies, it's Christ. Those who are sanctified, that's us, the church. And we are all of one. We are all of one. We come under the same roof. We come under the same leadership or lordship of one, and that being the Father, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Listen to that. He is not ashamed to call us brethren. Why? Because we're sanctified. Sanctification brings a joy to our Lord. He's not ashamed of us. Let me tell you, let me tell you what makes him ashamed. Is when, when people claim to be Christians and live like hell. What makes him ashamed is preachers that get up in a pulpit and preach one thing and then live another. What makes him ashamed is when believers profess one thing and then live another. But he's never ashamed of a sanctified soul. That soul that's been made holy and set apart unto his use. He is never ashamed of a sanctified soul. Why? Because he calls them brethren. That means we're all of the same spiritual stock and the same spiritual DNA. We are sanctified by the precious blood of Jesus. And therefore he says, I'm not ashamed to call them brethren. That's why he says, I profess them before holy angels and before my father. They've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. He's not ashamed. He's not ashamed 
He's not ashamed to call us his own. Amen. He's not ashamed to call us his family. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. The question is, are we ashamed of him? That's the question. In this day and hour where we're being pushed and, and prodded into a corner, are we going to be ashamed of him? Oh, God, let us rise and shine and bro boldly proclaim the goodness of the name of Jesus. He said he's not ashamed to call us his brethren. Verse number 12 says, saying, and we're going back to the Old Testament uh, uh, examples here, pulling again from the Psalms, Psalms 22 here, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. This is Jesus speaking through the spirit of prophecy in the Old Testament. Through the psalmist, he says, I, saying, I will declare thy name unto thy brethren and in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. I like this right here. In the midst of the church, I'll sing praise. So let me see if I get this right. And if I, get, if I understand things right, it ought to be that whenever I get up to preach, that Christ gets up and preaches through me and declares the name of the Father to the brethren. And, and you understand something. When it talks about declaring the name of the Father to the brethren, it, it's not just talking about Jehovah, not just talking about Yahweh, not just talking about Elohim, uh, El Shaddai, not just talking about the names per, per, per se there, but he's talking about the character of the Father. It ought to be that whenever I get up and preach, that Christ preaches through me and declares the character and the nature of the name of the Father. This is a beautiful thing and an insight that we preachers and teachers need to understand that when we get up to preach and teach, it's not just us. It is Christ arising within us and speaking to that congregation. May every minister that may listen to this, this Bible study or this message tonight understand that when you get up and open your mouth, it's not just you. It is Christ standing up within you and through you declaring the name of the Father to that church. But not just for us preachers, you go on into the next line and he says and in the midst of the church will I sing praises unto thee. Ladies and gentlemen let me just tell you now that includes all of us that when we come to the house of God in the midst of the church when we come to the church in the midst of this place that Jesus Christ himself comes by way of the Holy Ghost hallelujah comes by way of the spirit same way in the preaching by the way of the Holy Ghost he comes and he fills us and as we begin to sing praise Jesus to the Father, by Him, by His Spirit within us, He joins in with us singing praises to the Father. That ought to change our perspective on church services. It isn't we just come and go in a passing glance. It is that when we come, Christ joins in with us by the Holy Ghost, and He preaches through that preacher, and He praises through that congregation. Oh, what a union this is. I hope that some of you have just seen the dynamic change in your attitude about how church is and how church ought to operate. We ain't just coming in here to sing four or five songs, get out of here after we hear a man preach to us for about 45 minutes, go on our merry little old way. No, no. We're coming in here to join in with the Lord Jesus himself by way of the Holy Ghost operation within the house and we all join together with voices and blended in harmony and we praise the Father for all the goodness the Father's done for us. Amen. This preacher comes to that pulpit and the Spirit of Christ gets a hold of him and I declare the goodness of God to this church. Ladies and gentlemen, may you never lose sight. Don't lose sight of what the church service is all about. Amen. I hope I've taught you something right there and hope I've helped you that when we come back here this Sunday, I know it's July the 5th and our minds are on barbecue and beaches, but I know when we come back in this place, if we come back with a right heart and the right spirit, the Lord Jesus is gonna descend in this place by working the Holy Ghost and blend his voices with ours as we begin to worship the Father. And as I come to this pulpit to preach what the Lord's laid on my heart, whether it be good, bad, or ugly, hard to take, or
are, are easy to take, that he's going to blend his voice with mine, and I'm going to tell you the goodness of God, amen, and the, and the plan of God, the nature of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the grace of God. Oh, church is more than just coming together and getting through it. It is coming together with Christ and him operating through us and sending preaching and praise back to the Father. Amen. Oh, that's good preaching right there. Verse number 13, he says, and again, I will put my trust in him. This is Isaiah chapter eight he, he refers to here. Again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Oh, listen to that. Again, go back to that concept. He's not ashamed of us. That, that the Lord Jesus will one day display his church. You know, Paul talked about that, that we are his workmanship, that we are meant to be displayed for all ages to come, to show the riches of his goodness to us for, for all ages to come. In other words, when we get to heaven, we're going to be a display to every living creature there of the great work of God's redemptive provision in the life of a human being. And here the writer goes back to Isaiah chapter 8 and says, look at the children God has given me. Jesus is going to boast of his church. Jesus even now, I believe, boasts of his church, that real church that stands on planet earth. Amen. Just as much as he stood up for Stephen when Stephen was being stoned, I believe he stands up for us and says, look at the children God's given me. Hallelujah. Look at the children by the working of the Holy Ghost that God has given to me. God's son boasts of his church. He loves his church. He's not ashamed of his church. He doesn't look at us and say, well, that's some ugly bride and I don't want anybody to meet her. No, no. He says, look at the beauty of my bride. Look at the children that God has produced in, 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 in the church. Verse number 14, he says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Boy, that's just good, isn't it? Whew. That's just good. Mm. Listen to what he says. Children are, are partakers of flesh and blood. In other words, my son, my daughter have the, 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 the same genetics, the gen, genetic makeup and the blood type that I have and my, their mama and all, uh, they... They're partakers of our nature, our, our DNA, our heritage going back however far it goes back, whatever's back there in our heritage, whether they be Indians or, or, or any other race that may be mixed in there, it's part of it. It's all in there. Amen. They're partakers of that nature. They're partakers of that flesh and blood. They carry it home. And so here what we see here that he said he also himself likewise took on the same. In other words, Jesus says, I'm not going to come back as an angel. We'll see it in just a second. He's going to, he's going to, he says, I'm going to be a partaker of flesh and blood. I'm going to take on that nature of Adam and all that it means and all that's back there in his history. All that's going on, all the, the failure and all the mixture and all that's happened in him, I'm going to take on that myself. He said he took on the same, the same struggles that you and I face. He entered in, into humanity's prison just like one of humanity's prisoners and he set humanity free. He didn't come as some separate deity that had no feeling to what we were dealing with and the awful bondage of sin. He came just like us. And here he says the reason he did it, he, 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 he did it that through death, again, he had to take on that human form in order to die. That through death by means of Calvary, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He went and died at Calvary, to, not to, dis, to, to necessarily to destroy uh, uh, death. He, death's going to be dethroned. Death reigned from Adam till Christ. Death's been dethroned and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. It will be destroyed. But the whole goal is to destroy the one that took the power of death. Remember, it was forfeited. Adam gave up all this dominion. Satan took the power of death when he did and, and, and began to rule through death. And here the writer says that Jesus will put an end to him that has the power of death. That's what the word destroy means. Put an end to the one that had the power of death, the rule of death, he that, that had command of death. Here he, he says, I'm going to put an end. Jesus, listen, hell may have rejoiced. Even Jesus said in that garden whenever those came to, to uh, arrest him, he says, now's your time and the time of darkness. Hell's having a ball right now because it thinks it's winning. 
But what, he, what they did not know was when Jesus died on that cross and rose again that third day, he destroyed the one that had the power of death. That's why after his resurrection, the bodies of many saints that slept came out of their graves, showing us that death had been defeated and death had been destroyed. He came to destroy him that had the power of, of, of death. That's the devil. Let me just put it right out here to you. The devil ha, is going to be put to an end. His power, his rule, his reign, and his his league with death is going to be put to an end. Verse number five or 15, and the reason he's going to do it, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hear what he says. Again, it's not that Christians don't die. It's just that we don't have to fear death. He says, Jesus came to destroy the one that had the power of death, to deliver us from the bondage of the fear of death. We don't have to be afraid of death. I was talking with someone the other day about a, a man that was in my home church. Wonderful man. My time's getting by on me quick. Hang with me. Wonderful man. And when my wife's dad passed away suddenly of a heart attack, and, and we were talking to him, and, and he, he looked at us, and the, this friend of my dad's that I'm talking about, he looked at us and said, you know what, I, I envy him. He's, he, he's gone home. He's made it home. You know, you, you look at somebody like that and say, well, they're strange. It's a strange prayer. But, but you know what? We in the church of God used to sing, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. How many people you know can sing a song, hallelujah, when I die? Not many. I'm going to tell you why. Because they hadn't been born again. But the man, the woman that's been born again, you might, you might, it's not saying that we want death or we're inviting death. But there is a peace over death that when the child of God leaves this world, yes, we'll shed our tears and we have our grief. It's not that we have a fear of they're, they're now lost to us. It's that separation is so painful. There is victory for the child of death. Oh, death, oh, hallelujah. Where is your sting? Oh, death, oh, grave, where is your victory? All of that's been done away with because of Christ. Understand what he said. He came to deliver us from the fear of death. That's a good word for somebody right now in the midst of COVID-19. We that are born again have been delivered from the fear of death. Amen. We, because it brings bondage. Fear brings bondage. Hear what I'm telling you. Not trying to be mean here. But fear brings bondage bondage. Verse number 16, I'm over. For verily he took not on him the nature of, of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Goes back to what he said, what he said in verse number uh, 14 when he talks about being a partaker of flesh and blood. He took on the flesh and blood nature of Abraham and didn't come as an angel. Wherefore in verse number 17, in all things it behooved him. That means, that word behooved means that he owed it he felt like it was fitting. It was fitting for him to be made like unto his brethren. Here's the reason that he might be a merciful, hallelujah, and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That, that verse right there is enough to preach an hour on. He felt it fitting. That's what it means to be behooved. He felt it right. He felt it proper. He felt like it was owed to us that he be made like us, that he might be a merciful. First of all, he is a merciful high priest. That means he is sympathetic. It means he's compassionate. It means he understands. I know the pull of temptation. I know the pull and how grievous that it can be. I know how difficult it can be. Therefore, he is merciful when you fall. You can get up because he's merciful. He's merciful. That's why when you fall, you hear and feel the convicting touch of the Holy Ghost prodding you to pray and to repent. That's you getting back up again because he's merciful. He understands and he can look to the Father and say, I know what they're going through. I know how tough it is to be a human being. I know how tough it is to go through these dark days and these days of difficulty. Please, Father, for my sake, would you forgive them? For me, would you do it? And the Father says, always for you, son. It's always been for you, son. You're their mediator because 
because you ask me, I will have mercy on them. He is merciful. But not only is he merciful, he is faithful. That, you know what that tells me? He's faithful. That means he'll be there tomorrow if you fall. Amen. That means that if you get overwhelmed with something, he'll be there. Amen. You, you never find that that place is empty and he's gone somewhere else and he's missing. No, no. He's faithful. He is sure. He is certain. He is going to be there just as sure tomorrow as he's been there the last millennial and, and eternity past. He will be there in the future, ladies and gentlemen. No matter what happens in this world, he is merciful and he is faithful. He will be there for us. He is a high priest, the intercessor. He's at better priests that we're talking about. He's that intercessor in the things pertaining to God and the whole purpose is to make reconciliation. The word reconciliation, there's propitiation which means a turning away of wrath. It is also a picture of the mercy seat. Here we see that the whole purpose of Christ and his mercy and his faithfulness is to turn away wrath from, the, for, from us for the sins of the people. And verse number 18, verse number 18, here we go. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Oh, my goodness. By the way, I preach a message, but we see Jesus. You may hear it sometime in the future. You'll hear this stuff again. But listen to the powerful things that it says right here. The reason he is so merciful, the reason he is so faithful, is he himself suffered being tempted. He suffered being tempted. You think those 40 days of praying and fasting and temptation in that wilderness was easy? No, it was a time of suffering our Lord dealt with. That's why an angel came and ministered to him after it was over with. Being led of the Spirit into that wilderness, he suffered 40 days at the mouth of that devil. For 40 days, that's all he heard was that devil talking, that devil tempting him, that devil trying to get him to bow down. For 40 days he dealt with that nonsense and the enemy berating him, berating him, it brought suffering to him. See, Jesus knows how it is when the devil beats on your mind and beats on your heart and berates you over and over and over and the only voice it seems like you ever hear is the voice of the devil. He understands that suffering. And because he understands that suffering, the Bible says he is able. Oh, just those words right there is just wonderful. He is able to secure. That word secure simply means to run to the cry of those that are in danger and to bring them help. Amen. He is able to help those who are tempted. He is able to come to the rescue of those who are being beaten down by the trial and the temptation of the soul. The Bible says, abstain from fleshly lusts for they war against the soul. How true that is. And Jesus says, I'm able to give you aid. I'm able to give you help when the, when the beating of temptation comes your way. Man is, listen, you have to understand something about temptation. Temptation is always personal. A man is tempted and enticed when he's drawn away by his own lust, personal things. But Jesus knows it. Why? Because he's been made a partaker of flesh and blood. He knows how personal it is. And because of that, in his faithfulness, in his mercifulness, he comes and rescues the tempted. Hallelujah. And remember, this is being written to people who are being drawn back, being pushed back, being, being berated by the enemy. And here the writer says, run to Jesus. He is faithful, he is merciful, and he is able to help you. I pray that this has helped you as much as this has helped me. I tell you, I have felt the Holy Ghost in this thing. And I believe that this has been a divine word spoken for somebody. I believe that in that 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 as I told you just a second ago over there in that in that twelfth verse, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. I believe that the Lord Jesus has has taken this old flawed human vessel and spoken the name of the Father to you today. I pray that you have been blessed by it. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless your people now. And I pray especially for those that are under the heavy hand of temptation. Come to their rescue, come to their cry. In the name of Jesus, help them to understand now. That word secure means, secure means to come to the cry. 
Lord, help them to cry. Help them to cry out. Help them not to keep their mouths shut and ponder the temptation, but help them to cry out, Lord, help me to get victory over this. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, I ask it now. Amen and amen. Thank you for the extra time you've given me. May the Lord bless you and keep you as my prayer. I'm looking forward to being in service with you this Sunday morning, July the 5th. Let us come and worship the God that truly gives liberty. In Jesus' name, may you be blessed. Amen.